are recorded for your convenience so you can go back and listen to them at a more convenient time than what you have right now. The lucky ones of us that get to hear it live, we get to ask all the questions. But if you've got questions afterwards, I'm going to encourage you in the chat box, go ahead and, and ask your question. And of course, um, Michael Foley, who is with us here this evening, I'm going to ask for him to type a contact information in there so that you guys can directly connect with him as well. And if uh, Richard doesn't mind doing the same thing, in case someone has a specific question, then I'll have you put that in the chat box as well. That way it shows up in our recordings. So this evening, we are honored to have someone talk to us about the importance of vitamin D as it applies to prepping a person for the possibility of implants and PRF. Who is not doing PRF in their office? If you're not, you're missing a golden window. You know, we hear that some states have hygienists that are allowed to draw, and those are the states that usually a hygienist can do anesthetic as well. Here in Texas, it's not legal for a dental hygienist, even if they've taken a phlebotomy class, to do a blood draw. Therefore, in order to set yourself up as a safe office, you enlist the help of a physician friend of yours to become your medical director. And then anybody he deems that can draw blood under that, he takes responsibility for that. So there is a way around it, but we want to make sure that everybody's safe and that you're not losing a license over something stupid like that. So I would like to turn this evening's meeting over to our presenter for this evening. Thank you so much. I'm going to mute myself. Perfect. Um, thank you for having me. And of course, uh, welcome everybody that's listening uh, on multiple platforms. Uh, true honor for me to, to be here and to share this knowledge on vitamin D. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen right now. Um, so yeah, of course, I know you mentioned Pure F and other things. Um, you know, this topic of vitamin D is just so relevant that it requires truly a full hour to go over all of the important aspects uh, of this technology and kind of what's new, exciting, the research that we've done, um, and also the clinical applications of it in, for clinical practice. Um, I always give credit to a lot of my supervisors. So for those that don't know me personally, I, I'm Canadian, but I grew up in Bern, Switzerland, where I did a lot of work uh, specifically in Switzerland. Uh, to be around big implant companies. So most of the major implant companies, including uh, Stroman, Nobel, uh, Zeramax, Z-Systems. So the, even the, uh, the Swiss are very good at implants. So of course, most of the zirconia implants are from Switzerland as well. And I'm going to talk more specifically about both clinical work uh, that's done by these two gentlemen, as well as preclinical work which is kind of the space that I live in. I live in both worlds a little bit and kind of talk about, you know, what we do in the research, you know, looking at histology, looking at how implants are integrating and how we've really realized that people that have deficiencies in vitamin D uh, becomes critically important for these implants to integrate. Um, our school is very well recognized for the research that we've done. So some of the work that we've published most recently, my supervisors had won some big awards here, uh, Dr. Schoolian, um, a lot to do with regeneration. For me personally, like I said, I'm a big biomaterials guy. I love biomaterials. Um, this book right here was one that I wrote with my friend that lived with me in Switzerland for a little while, Yufeng Zhang. And uh, what I try and do is I try and make biomaterials as safe as possible. So we're really into the study of, you know, I take this implant and I put it into the body. You know, always remember that it's a foreign object that's going into your body. And so if that implant is not, you know, characterized properly, if it's not built with the right surface topography, if the host isn't ready to accept that implant, they get rejected. And it does happen. I'm going to talk about percentages and uh, links between implant failure and different types of issues such as smoking uh, or other things. Um, the book itself, like I said, if anybody ever wants to read a book, last year I was shocked because it was ranked number one most sold book by quintessence in the world. And I think one of the reasons why is because, you know, a lot of people don't have um, knowledge on when to use different types of biomaterials and what their differences are. We've got a beautiful section actually that was dedicated in the book to holistic practice. And so we purposely said, if you want to practice without allografts and xenografts and animal products, you know, how to use PRF and autogenous bone and mm -hmm. 
graphs. Um, that was all included in the book. Be okay. So um, it's very important to understand that when biomaterials enter your body, people think it's a very happy space. So implant goes into the body, bone cells come in contact with the implant and make bone, and you know everybody's happy. But the reality is that's not the case at all. The reality is, is that when any material enters your body, the first cells that come in contact with a new material is immune cells. And those are typically macrophages, so immune cells, macrophages. And they decide whether or not they like this material, they don't like it. And if they don't like it, that's one of the reasons why materials get rejected from the body. And if those macrophages in that immune system is not properly regulated, um, that's when you're really going to have big issues. And that's where we have found uh, with vitamin D is a very important immunomodulator. And when, when patients are deficient in vitamin D, of course, then these implants and these biomaterials don't integrate uh, as effectively. Um, I was lucky because Donald Brunette was a Canadian guy and he did a lot of research with respect to macrophage, looking at the polarization um, and how they, they integrate, basically how implants integrate. One of his papers that was published 10 years ago looked at on titanium implant surfaces, how they're always preceded by macrophage accumulation. And so he's one of the first guys to really look at a lab and say, okay, implants going into the body, it's not you know, happy medium where bone is being formed, it's really immune cells are accumulating. And these macrophages are then deciding, you know, whether or not that, that implant should be uh, integrated or not. And he's won a lot of big awards for the work that he's done. Now, um, I, of course, I'm a, I'm a cell biologist by training. Uh, I know a lot on cell biology. I'm also a dentist and studying the field of perio. But, you know, there's a little bit to know here with respect to macrophages. And this diagram here just kind of breaks it down simply where macrophages, they're called very plastic cells. And that means that they can be very inflammatory or they can be very happy. And the way that we characterize that in science is that if we say a macrophage is M1, then it causes tissue injury. And if a macrophage is M2, then it's very tissue repair, okay? And these macrophages can shift back and forth very, very rapidly. So what we found is, of course, you know, macrophages are the first cell type in contact with biomaterials. They're absolutely critical during bone modeling and remodeling. But one of the important things that we found, uh, and these are from basic science studies, we induced a kind of twofold increase in osteoblast mineralization. Okay. So what we found is that macrophages. Um, and the the more important than actually uh, like BMPs or, or growth factors that make bone. So it's very, very important that these immune cells are happy, number one, and more importantly for clinicians that work with even something like platelet-rich fibrin. Platelet-rich fibrin might induce a 60% increase, like 0.6 fold increase in the potential of bone. Okay, it's very minimal. When you look at immune cells, it's 23 fold. So it's a big, big, big jump. Okay, so it's a big, big, big difference here. Um, and like I said, studies have shown that immune cells, if they're M1, so they're inflammatory by day eight, they can become anti-inflammatory in three days. They can shift back and forth. And this is very important around, let's say, perimplantitis, because that macrophage that's unhappy and is M1, they can shift back and be happy and be M2 within three days and they can go back and be unhappy again in three days. So it's very, very quick that these cells, you know, they adapt to their environment very, very quickly. And it's one of the reasons why with plaque, for instance, just around periodontal disease, you know, it's something that can be inflammatory. And if you brush your teeth and things go well within, you know, a couple hours to days, you know, you can get resolution fairly quickly. Um, our group in Bern, Switzerland, a lot of people don't know this, is actually one of the groups that developed most of the zirconia implant systems. And we work very closely with companies and we're one of the first people to show how zirconia implants integrate. So here, most of these older studies, we have some that date back in the 2005, 2010, where we look at titanium, uh, different types of zirconia, um, and, and look at how they integrate. And it's something that our, our research team in Bern has been doing for years and years and years. And so we've gotten a very good idea of, you know, what's, what's going on when these implants go into the body. Um, I like this paper here a lot. It was published by the Swedish group. It was Brainmark's uh, former group from Nobel. 
And they were really characterizing what happens when you get bacteria in these pockets and how it influences immune cells and how these immune cells become foreign body giant cells and uh, on and on and on. And so it's been very interesting to read a lot of the literature on, on titanium and what's happened and how today I believe there's quite a big shift that's ongoing because more and more people are talking about uh, this concept right here. And uh, it was actually one of my friends uh, and I call him kind of like my roommate when I was in Michigan that uh, published this work is metal particle release associated with parent plant bone destruction. And in it, you can actually read about these titanium particles that are being released um, and talking about how it relates to implant failure and how in dental medicine, emerging information about metal titanium particle release suggests the potential impact of biomaterials at their interface, okay? And there's some quite big names on this paper. There's uh, Kathy Nelson, Dennis Tarnow, Tomley Wang, Will Ginobili. And people started to really focus on, you know, what's going on with the immune system. It didn't have to do with how much bone loss, et cetera. It has to do with, what is your immune cell doing when these titanium particles are getting released? And like I said, our team in Bern, Switzerland, this is one guy that I really want to introduce. So his name is Dieter Bosart. And uh, when I was in Switzerland, he was head of histo lab, so histology, and I was head of uh, cell biology. And we worked very closely together. And he wrote many of the important articles on austenogration of titanium, titanium alloys, and zirconia. And so just to briefly um, uh, say this, I, I work in Florida now, and he comes once per year to Nova Southeastern University and gives this absolutely fantastic course, uh, both he and I, all about, about zirconia implants and, and their evolution, uh, but it's really science focused. So it's not, you know, it's not like, don't put a metal in your body and et cetera. It's really, this is what happens when you have titanium. This is titanium particle release and corrosion. This is zirconia. This is the difference in how they integrate. And it's very, very highly scientific, written by some of the most scientific group in the whole world. And uh, this year it will be in December. So it's December 11th and 12th. For those that are more into the zirconia world and that really want to figure out a way to approach regeneration, both from a biomaterial perspective as well as implant, um, I highly recommend looking into this course. And um, I can give more info on, on where to find that stuff a little bit later. Now, it's really interesting because, like I said, I've been really involved in immune cell research now on biomaterials. And reading a lot of the old literature, it's very funny because, of course, we know today gum disease is very prevalent and it's impacted 50% of adults here in the United States. Uh, we're, we're aware of this. But when you go on the perio.org websites and some of the other websites, you see very closely the correlation between perio disease and strokes and Alzheimer's and respiratory disease and heart disease, diabetes, you know, these links have all been uh, made today and they're established. If you were to say, you know, a dentist 50 years ago that what's going on in your mouth is going to affect what's going on in your heart and Alzheimer's, et cetera, you know, as a dentist before, you would have been considered like a little uh, off, I don't want to say off target, but it's, you would have been a little bit of a nutshell back then. But today, things are very, very well established. Know very, very well that period disease, uh, strokes, Alzheimer's, these links are very well made. Um, in, it is on the website directly word for word, it'll say it is now well recognized, of course, that inflammation in your body itself caused by periodontal bacteria is involved in the pathogenesis of many chronic illnesses, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and arthritis. And it's interesting because for some time, people started to try and understand, you know, is perio disease causing uh, uh, heart disease, diabetes, or is diabetes, diabetes causing perio disease, and what's the link? But the reality is, is that both of them cause inflammation, and both of them increase inflammation in your whole body. So if you have one of these problems, you're going to have this problem across uh, your entire so it's quite interesting to learn that. Now, if you want to look at this from a scientific term, what this actually means is that immune, your immune system is dysregulated. So if you really understand immune cell health and the M1, M2 differences, it means that now your body's become shifted more towards M1 and it's more inflammatory. And so it's going to cause a lot of issues in your body. And at Harvard, actually, they've done just a, a huge amount of great research, of course, at Harvard and 
and Forsyth, they've come up with these anti-inflammatory molecules and they're called resolvents. And they've done all this great work. Here's two of uh, colleagues that are well-respected in the field, uh, Dr. Van Dyke and Dr. Kantarchi. And these molecules actually are meant to try and uh, prevent inflammation. Okay. So here, this study here in 2018, it's really titled Resolving Macrophages Counter Osteolysis by Anabolic Calcium and Bone Cells. And when we go through the study, of course, it's the animal model. And the animal model is interesting because uh, you have a certain amount of sulcus, of course, like in humans, but you can actually wrap ligatures around these teeth and get a lot of bone destruction, what you see here. And that happens within three weeks. And then, of course, in the experimental models, they try and regrow the bone, so regrow the periodontal tissues. And it happens fairly quickly in an animal model, so it's great. Like I said, here, ligature is placed. Red zone is inflammation, so you get a lot of inflammation. You can then remove the ligature and start to regenerate this tissue. So what was very different about this study was that everybody for years always thought, you know, let's put endogain in these pockets or let's put pure F in the pockets and then we'll help um, stimulate regeneration. And these authors very interestingly said, what we're going to do is play with the immune system. Okay. And they had two experimental groups because we were starting to learn that these immune cells are very uh, relevant. They could completely eliminate macrophages. So with this num number one drug, uh, uh, Clodronate, they would eliminate macrophages, and the other one would actually induce them to become M2, so they become happy macrophages. And they put these drugs in these pockets to see what would happen. So when we look at the data and we look at the images here, this is the bone loss, okay? You can see a lot of bone loss in the control group. So if you put a ligature around this tooth, you're gonna lose a lot of bone. Now, if you completely eliminate macrophages, you don't lose very much bone, okay? And what was very interesting about the study is that even if these macrophages are happy, so they're M2, you lose more bone than you would if they're just gone. Okay, and the, the whole purpose of this experiment was to show very, very clearly that if you eliminate the immune system, you will not lose bone, okay? And it really shocked a lot of people that work in research because then we said, well, wow, amazingly, these immune cells must be incredibly important for right? You can eliminate them, no bone loss. And then they did the exact same experiment, but they did it the other way. They went with bone regeneration and gave the exact same two drugs. And interestingly, if you lost bone and you did nothing, you would regenerate some bone. So that's your control. If you lost the bone and you eliminated the macrophages, you could not regrow that bone, okay? It was impossible to regrow it. And if you made them happy macrophages, so M2 macrophages, you'd regrow a lot of bone, okay? And so the moral here is that if these macrophages are happy, you're gonna make more bone, that's number one. But I think more importantly was that when you eliminated the macrophages, you didn't lose bone or you didn't make bone, which meant that the macrophages in the immune system is controlling bone loss as well as bone formation. And that's a very, very powerful and key uh, important finding because now it means as researchers, the real target are immune cells. If you can control immune cells and you can get them to be more happy, they'll make bone for you. And if you can eliminate them somehow when you have bone loss, you can prevent bone loss, okay? And that's kind of where the field is going when it comes to um, regeneration. Now I wrote this article back in 2016 with some other uh, respected colleagues um, Alberto is one of my, my good buddies who lives out in Europe, uh, was in Michigan, and I went to Michigan and he went to Bern. Uh, we kind of crossed paths a little bit. Both worked with a couple other guys. So Angel here was another uh, co-resident as well as Professor Wang, who's very well known in the implant field. And we wrote this article titled Basis of Bone Metabolism Around Dental Implants During Austin Integration. And strangely, um, we talked about low vitamin D here. We talked about immune cells as being discussed as key regulators during osteointegration and how these cells are crucial important for presence of biofilm and their association byproducts uh, that lead to soft tissue breakdown. And so this study was very, very um, relevant. It, it talked on a basic level, what's going on when these implants are integrating, et cetera. And to my surprise, I got an email one day and it said, congratulations. Dear Dr. Myron, uh, we are pleased to announce that your article here was one of the top 20 most downloaded in recent history. 
in recent publication history, among the articles published July 2016 to June 2018. And I remember scratching my head and I, I thought to myself, wow, this is one of the 20 most downloaded articles in all of, in all of dentistry. And I was doing lots of work on platelet-rich fibrin. I was doing lots of work on zirconia implants and other implants and on platelet-rich fibrin. And, you know, when I got the introduction today, you know, everybody's saying how great platelet-rich fibrin is and how important it is. But the reality is, is during this period of time, I was doing lots of research on platelet-rich fibrin, but this paper was the one that was actually most downloaded and cited as a result of how important it is, okay? Uh, this is by far the most important research that we were publishing between these years because clinicians that were reading it understood how important it was for implants to integrate and for biomaterials to integrate and for guiding your patients to have proper healing. Now, vitamin D is, it's, uh, you know, it's almost strange for me to present and lecture on vitamin D because everybody knows what it is. Everybody's aware of it. Everybody knows that if you have osteoporosis, the first vitamin that you get from your doctor is vitamin D with vitamin K. Um, and of course, it's very important for treating diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, multiple sclerosis. You see a lot of these links. In fact, if you read the vitamin D papers, you see a lot of the links associated with Alzheimer's, asthma, depression, diabetes, all of these different things here. And it's the same things as perio disease. It's so, it's so interesting. And the real link between all of these different fields is the immune, the immune system, immune cell health. And vitamin D is very important for immune cells. So what happens in the body is that if you're deficient in this very important vitamin that will control your immune cells, then what happens is if you place an implant into a host tissue, well, your immune cell his job is supposed to be go sense this new material, decide whether it likes it. If it likes it, it calls in bone cells and makes bone. But the problem is, is that if that immune cell is off and he's not working properly because he's missing vitamins and mineral and he's a little bit confused, well, then it sees this new material and it says, you know what? I don't want this. And it shoots it out. And that's the main reason for early implant failure. Uh, here. Now in 2009 um, was one of the first papers on this topic and they looked at vitamin D and bone physiology and they demonstrated that uh, in an implant model, how important vitamin D was for osteointegration. And more than 10 years ago, we've known that these animals that were vitamin D deficient had a 66% reduction in implant pullout strength. And what that means is that the way researchers do these studies, this is bone, this is implant, implant goes in, you let it integrate. And what we do is we literally try and rip these implants out and we try and figure out how much strength that implant has. And if this animal is vitamin D deficient, it's only got 33% the strength of a normal implant. So it falls out 66% reduction in that strength. Okay. So it's critically important. In 2012, my former supervisor, uh, Reinhard Gruber and his group uh, figured out that actually vitamin D is very important. Uh, negative uh, factor, of course, for integration. We already knew that. But more importantly, he found that it could be compensated with supplementation, okay? So the conclusions for their studies was that they were giving dietary vitamin D. They were literally feeding in Beans. the- Beans. Uh, but Out. Out. These results indicate that vitamin D deficiency had a negative impact on cortical peri-implant bone formation, which can be compensated by vitamin D supplementation, okay? In 2014, uh, people started looking at, you know, its relationship in humans to early implant failure. So now vitamin D is a causative factor in failure of immediate placed implants. So these papers started coming out. Another paper, two neglected biological risk factors in bone grafting and implantology, high LDL cholesterol and low serum vitamin D. And since then we've learned, you know, it's really to do with um, vitamin D. And again, here's my, my colleague, Toby same guy who wrote the article on titanium particle release. Before he wrote that paper, he wrote a paper on early implant failure of these cases, okay? And he and I had the same uh, feeling and sentiment. We're working in a university, we're working at some of the top schools in the world, and we're supposed to, as researchers, try and figure out why implants are failing. You know, these are not, you know, you had a tough case, there was, there was a big bacterial infiltration and the implant failed. These are the cases that you have lots of bone, it looks like a slam dunk case. You raise a flap, 
you got beautiful blood and you put your implant in, it's bleeding, everything looks happy. And uh, four to six weeks later, it's a spinner. Okay, it's just falling out of the mouth. And we're looking at these cases and we're saying, you know, what the heck is going on? And to be quite honest, at the time we were, we were doing a lot of the research with zirconia and we actually thought that maybe patients were, would have allergies to zirconia. I mean, it sounds silly to say that now because we know it's a little bit more the opposite with titanium and zirconia being a little more uh, biocompatible. But at the time, you know, when you're first placing these zirconia implants you're, and they're, some of them are failing, you're scratching your head saying, holy geez, is it the material? Is it an allergy? And so we would send them to the hospital and get uh, uh, allergy tested because the, the hospital is right across the street from, from where we were working. And every single time, nobody came back with an allergy. Everybody, every single time, people came back with deficiencies in minerals and vitamins. And the most common one was vitamin D. Okay? And so this is one of the first papers where they started to really clue in and figure that out. Now, when we fast forward several years, um, this paper here is a great one, was written by some of my colleagues, Dr. Paz and Dr. Uh, Mangano, who are working on a paper with us right now. But they found that low vitamin D uh, was very much correlated with early dental implant failure. And the beauty of this study was that it was gathered over many, many clinics. It had 2, 000, nearly 2,000 implants and 1,000 patients. Okay, So it was finally a big study. It wasn't like, hey, we have a few failures here and there. It was here's 2,000 implants and 1,000 patients. Let's go ahead and do a very big study. And so overall, there was a 4% failure rate, which is something that we've expect and something that we teach in school. Um, and of course, if you're a heavy smoker, and that's defined as 15 cigarettes per day, which is a lot, of course, that's 6%. So then you have a 2% increase or from 4% to 6%, so 50% increase. If you had generalized perio, of course, it got bumped up a little bit as well. But if you were vitamin D deficient, it was 11%, okay? And um, I skipped over that fast here. The real moral was that vitamin D deficiency had a higher risk factor than smoking and generalized perio. And um, I remember, you know, at the time in, in Europe, many of us were uh, scratching our heads related to this topic because many of us were making patients that were smoking 15 cigarettes per day, we would make them sign informed consent forms, right? We would say, absolutely, you got to sign this form, you're at a greater risk. And how many people are actually asking their patients to sign informed consents when they're vitamin D deficient? How many patients even know that? And how many doctors know that, okay? And when you look at the numbers now in this big, big, big study with 2000 implants, then you start scratching your head. You say, for all these years, I've been placing implants and I have no idea what the vitamin D levels are, okay? And, and every person that has placed at least 100 implants can always point to a few cases that and you say, you know, I never would have expected this implant to fail, but they do. And I can almost guarantee you that 99% of the time, it's as a result of that host tissue. So those vitamin D levels were too low. And that was one of the reasons why uh, these implants were failing. So we're starting to learn this, right? And now I'm going to talk about what we do about this. So how, how we improve the field. Um, it's been so interesting because, of course, I've been doing research in vitamin D supplements, et cetera, for more than five years. But you start to see the coronavirus and how it's affected society. And the recommendations from the CDC worldwide has been vitamin D deficiency, global pandemic, you know, vitamin D is a proven powerful immunomodulator, you know, and they're recommending that people supplement. Okay. You got to get your levels up. And it's interesting because it's, it's, of course, it's accurate. If your immune system is functioning more properly, if you get the coronavirus, you're more likely to be able to uh, fight it, resolve it. Um, and when you're low, that means your immune cells are not functioning properly you're more likely to get the disease and probably more likely you're to, you know, have more serious complications related to the disease. But think if this is such a powerful modulator, think it's also a bone vitamin. And now think that you're placing all these biomaterials into bone and think of what effect that has actually on, you know, on these procedures that you're doing as a dentist. Okay. Um, I live in the United States. If people are joining worldwide, there's different guidelines a little bit everywhere in the world. I really focus heavily on what's recommended in the United States. It's very similar to the United States, Europe. Different countries have different regulations. And I wanted to go over, you know, what's recommended in our country. 
A lot of colleagues will get together and make these standard uh, treatments. And this is all decided by the, endo uh, the Endocrine Society of the United States. And of course, we know that as long as you have more than 30 nanograms per ml, you're considered sufficient. Uh, preferred range is 40 to 60. And that preferred range really in surgery is where you want to be. And I'll explain why that is. Um, because when you go through surgery, and that can be as simple as extracting two third molars, you know, that's a, a stressful event for that patient. And vitamin D levels under stress will drop. Okay, they'll drop. So a normal person should take 2000 units per day. Okay, 1500, 2000 is what's recommended in, in the United States. If you're obese, you might need to take up to as much as three times more. If you're deficient, and that's defined anything lower than 20, they, a doctor will tell you to take 5,000 units per day for 12 weeks, okay? That's the standard. I remember looking at that and I remember saying, you know, if I have to place an implant, 12 weeks is a really long time to wait. I mean, some of these implants, they gotta go like now. And so I've been collaborating with a bunch of endocrinologists and nutritionists to try and figure out ways to not do 12 weeks, but to really make it as short as possible, essentially. And that's uh, some of the research that I want to pre present here. A lot of people are not aware of this. Um, you know, Europeans are a little bit more advanced than we are here in North American dentistry in general. That comes with biomaterials. They always come out first there. That comes with implants. You know, I can almost guarantee you, especially if this is more in the holistic realm of things, uh, more people are, you know, learning about new implants first in, in Europe and Switzerland is one of these headquarters. They get to use the implant systems before we ever do. And then when they're successful there, one or two years later, they come to the market here. And uh, it was the same thing with this concept. So vitamin D people became aware of it a little bit faster there. They had actually ways to measure vitamin D in office in 10 minutes from a single finger prick, okay? Like you measure glucose, you could take a, a little finger prick and with that one drop of blood with this little device, you could actually figure out what the vitamin D levels were. And this was great because we're starting to make all these relationships between, you know, okay, if my, if my patient is below 30, I have a three times higher failure rate of my implants. It goes from 4% to 11, which is almost 300% increase. Why would I ever place an implant in a patient that has a three times higher failure rate? I mean, it's just, when you actually understand the data and you've been part of it, you understand that you know there's no way I'm ever going to do that. I always tell clinicians, and of course we teach at the university. You know, for our students that are new to the field and and about to become professionals, I always tell them, you know, you got to do things as best you can always, because the worst thing you can do for your practice and for your reputation is have failures. If you place a beautiful implant in a central site, you know, in the aesthetic zone, and that thing fails, that person's unhappy they're complaining, they're sitting in the waiting room talking to other pa patients, complaining, they're going home talking to their wives, husbands, kids, parents, everybody. It's the worst thing that can happen for, you, for your own, um, for your, yourself as a professional. Minimize complications, okay? This was a very easy one because now we could figure out, hey, we're starting to really learn why implants are failing, okay? And so this is a test that I highly recommend. Only takes 10 minutes. As a dentist, um, you know, we get our assistants to do it. You train somebody in your office to do it. And like we train them to take glucose measurements if we need to. With a, a single drop of blood, you get the reading in literally 10 minutes. Okay, and I'll show you a little video of how this works. Um, this is the little kit. It's not complicated at all. Like I said, of course, you're gonna just place a little bit of alcohol on the finger and you're gonna do a little finger prick. Okay, draw out a little bit of blood. I'm going through the video fast just to save some time. When you have that drop of blood, you mix it with a little buffer here. And this buffer just reads the, um, uh, the, the level. So you mix them together. It's, a, it's almost the same test actually to measure uh, IgG levels and IgM levels in uh, COVID. So for those that have done the COVID testing, which we're doing currently in, a, in the office to make sure that patients don't have uh, COVID, it's, it's a very similar system, okay? One drop of blood like that, you place it there, you wait 10 minutes. So there's a little reader Okay, that goes over top of this thing and the band starts going. So there's the control band and the test band is going to start to uh, appear. And depending on how strong it is, this little device here will actually read it. Okay, so you just start it. And the way it works is you get a little card, it flashes over. 
okay? And, and this one here was 15 minutes. The European one was 15 minutes and the US one is uh, 10 minutes. So it's even better in, in, uh, in the United States. Your vitamin D, 50.2 nanograms per ml. Okay, this was done by one of our, uh, somebody working in, in, in our research team. Of course, we all know that we should be between 40 and 60 and people like to test themselves here and there. Um, and that's the preferred range, 40 to 60. I remember this device has only been cleared by the FDA uh, for sale probably about a year and a half ago or so, okay? I, when I came back from Europe, I brought my European system, even if it wasn't FDA clear, I said, you know, what harm am I gonna do taking a little finger prick, a couple drops of blood and, and actually getting the data? Luckily, there's been a, a company that's been able to produce and that's available as well through Dentomedica, which I'll show uh, how you can get access to this stuff, which is quite interesting stuff. Now, in medicine, uh, people are very aware of antioxidants, people that go through surgery. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, I'm just lectures on vitamin D, but of course, you know, antioxidants are really quite important. When our body is in the process of going through any kind of stressful event, that could be radiation, alcohol, smoking, exercise, whatever it may be, you know, you, you have oxidative stress, okay? And what prevents oxidative stress is antioxidants. So if this is your nucleus, right, and this is radiation, radiation's coming and it wants to hit your nucleus and disrupt DNA and cause mutation and potentially cause cancer. And what blocks that is antioxidants. So an antioxidant will block oxidative stress. It's very straightforward, oxidative stress, antioxidant. And they're like little shield guys that protect you. The more you have, the better you are. The problem is, is of course, in North America, we live in very stressful uh, lives. Uh, you know, more people are not exercising as much and, you know, alcohol use and habits and foods that we eat are not, are not as um, antioxidant rich, as well as surgery. When you go through surgery, that's a, a period of oxidative stress. And so you need these antioxidants to help you. And um, I remember as I was learning more and more about this through some of my collaborations, I've gone to some of the headquarters because I was telling them, look, guys, I'm a dentist. I'm, I'm in research. You know, this is the biomaterial research that I'm doing. We're having problems with implants. Some of them are failing and I need a solution. I don't want to wait 12 weeks, you know, make something that's a little bit more potent for me to get me on the right track that I can start going around testing it first of all. And then when it's been fully tested, then we can, you know, go out to the general dental population and give recommendations. I was amazed, you know, I walked into these facilities and it blew me away. I mean, they were gorgeous. I mean, they were big labs, you know, huge facilities. And I was scratching my head and I was saying, man, I didn't know that, you know, there was the industry was this big. I had no idea. But then I thought about it, you know, my parents are taking supplements, multivitamins, they take vitamin D. And then I, sometimes I would ask in my conferences when I'm teaching, how many people take supplements? And, you know, in a, in a dental population of dentists that are 50, I would say 70 to 80% of them are taking supplements. And then I say, well, how do you know your supplements are working, right? How do you know your supplements that you're taking every day are actually raising your levels to the right levels? Because for some people, you might be able to take 2000 units of vitamin D and that's the correct amount for you. But for another individual, for example, an obese patient or a smoker, that level will not be enough. Right. And so that's where, you know, I got to learn about all these things and, and figure out how important it was, which was real interesting actually for me who had been spent so much time around biomaterials. One of my colleagues that I respect a lot is Pat Allen, um, good friend of uh, Tony Schoolian. They've published some work together and, you know, two of the more uh, prolific periodontists of the world, you know, many years ago, he was publishing work on antioxidants and how important they are for oral health care. And like I said, antioxidants may be available through oral ingestion, diet, and vitamins. And, um, you know, this, it focused on antioxidants and free radicals and how important it is for periodontal disease. Okay. And another person that I give a lot of credit to is uh, Dr. Chappell's group out in London, UK, and his micronutrient approach to periodontal therapy. For prevention of periodontitis, daily nutrition should include antioxidants, vitamin D, and calcium. And if you have inadequate antioxidant levels, okay, you're going to have issues. And that's very, very well known and very well established. But as dentists, you know, we're not focused on these things. We're really focused, most of us on, you know, what's going on? When's my next implant case? You know, when can I do my next bone grafting procedure? You're not really thinking about how all of these different things affect uh, your body. 
um, I had a very interesting experience. I was, I'm, I'm well known for the work that I do with Platelet Rich Vibrant, of course. Um, and uh, we've done a lot of development of different, different PRF systems, uh, calibrated them all, written a lot of research papers and, and a book on that topic. And uh, I remember I was getting phone calls from plastic surgeons. I was living and working at, at uh, Nova Southeastern University down in Fort Lauderdale. And, you know, there's tons of plastic surgeons in Miami. They'd call me and they'd say, Dr. Myron, you know, we're reading your research on platelet-rich fiber and it's so interesting. Why don't you come to our office? So I'd go and show them how to use PRF. And, you know, they wanted to use it for soft tissue wound healing. So if you were doing a nose job, you know, and you had to make an incision, well, you could put PRF there and it would heal faster and the scar wouldn't be as bad. And they would do boob jobs and same thing. So it made sense. And I was happy to contribute and collaborate with them. Um, but every office that I went to, they always had this supplement and it was called Vitamedica. And I remember thinking, you know, what is Vitamedica? And I said, well, what is this stuff? You know, I've been to four different offices now and every one of them in the waiting room, they got Vitamedica sitting right on the counter. Or, you know, I said, what is this stuff? Well, and they, they would say, well, I can't believe you never heard of it. First of all, it's been around forever. So it's been around for 20 years and we do this to supplement our patients. And I say, really? And I was thinking, you know, in my head back to like what, what, uh, Pat Allen was doing and some of the other guys. And I said, oh, okay. He's like, you guys do this with everybody? He's like, every single patient. And, and then they look at me, they say, you know, Dr. Myron, you're, you're obviously uh, not stupid, but I want to ask you this very simple question. Why would you ever do an elective procedure such as a boob job or a nose job and risk not having that patient heal properly when we know that probably half the population is deficient in antioxidant levels? They would say, I'm not going to do a $5,000 procedure when I can supplement somebody for $100 and make sure that all their levels are at the right, you know, at the right levels before I do surgery. So I give them this supplement before, it's called Vitamedica. And then whenever I do surgery, I know that convincingly they're at the right levels, I can do surgery and they'll heal, you know, more effectively. And I'll probably minimize my failures. I say, man, I can't believe that people are not doing this in dentistry. So then what I did was I started taking Vitamedica and bring it into the clinic at school. And then patients that were going to get implants, et cetera, I would say, okay, you're going to take the supplement. I want to see if this stuff is working. Right. And uh, long story short, when you look at the, the actual data, you know, it's amazing in the United States, the population that's deficient in, in vitamins and minerals is just outrageous. And when you look at this list, and you look at the highest one, of course, it's vitamin D at 70%. And that's seven out of 10 patients are vitamin D deficient. And that's the one that regulates your immune system. And that's the one that's important for bone. And what do dentists do all day long? They place implants into bone. Okay. And it's just, it's shocking. I don't know the last time that I placed an implant in somebody that was vitamin D deficient because we're aware of it now. And too many of our colleagues are not fully aware of how important this is. So um, if you're not, like I said, read the literature. Uh, I have a Dropbox folder where I provide many very good articles uh, on the topic. And I, I select, I think, my five favorite ones that people to read, just how important this, this field is. So one of the issues with Vitamedica was that it didn't have vitamin D. It had some, but it had like 800 units of vitamin D. And uh, the Endocrine Society was recommending 5,000 if you were deficient. And I, and I remember calling the company and just saying, why don't you guys have more uh, vitamin D? This is a company made in the United States, made in, in California, good GMP standards, you know, very high quality stuff. I said, why don't you guys have vitamin D? Well, they said, we built this for plastic surgeons. You know, when you're doing a boob job, nose job, et cetera, bone is not so important. So we just need enough to make sure that they're regulated. But it's not like we're not placing implants in bone like you are. And I said, that makes sense. So then I said, I'm going to take Vitamedica and I'm going to give them Vitamedica and vitamin D. And then from the endocrinologist, I learned that vitamin D has to be given with vitamin K. I said, okay, no problem. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. And then I said, you know, this 12 week idea is too long. I said, how can I speed this up? Well, you can speed up, you know, absorption of vitamin D if you give them boron and manganese and all these other little cofactors that would help speed the, uh, the vitamin D levels. So then I started giving, you know, my patient like four or five different supplements. And I remember, one day it just occurred to me, I, you know, I felt like I was a, almost like a distributor of supplements or drugs, you know, here you go, here's your, 
your five supplements to every single patient coming in getting an implant. And I just went back to the main company and I just said, you know, why don't we create something that's more specific for bone? You know, just create one that's for dentists, that is for bone. And that's how Dentomedica came about. So Dentomedica is like the little, uh, little brother that is meant to do the same job, but it now has vitamin D. It's got vitamin D, vitamin K, and all the cofactors to help make bone. And, but it's got all the antioxidants that are standard in, 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 in Vitamedica. So then we started doing research with this stuff. I said, okay, let's start using it. And uh, I started going to these conferences. You know, back in 2016, this was amazing to me. I went to this conference and I asked the speaker, I said, can I have that slide? Because it's amazing to me. U.S. life expectancy, 2014, 15, 16, every year life expectancy goes down. Okay. And I really think about that deeply. Every single year, if you had a kid that was born today, he will not live as long as you do. And it's never happened before. Okay. It's never happened before. And U.S., despite all of the technology and we are the most advanced country in the world in medicine, we have a very moderate life expectancy at 78 years old. And that has to do with heart disease and cancer. It has to do with poor nutrition. So, you know, they'll give recommendation, eat right, exercise, don't smoke, like take holidays and all this other stuff. But the reality is, and you know, I know this from living in, in Switzerland, you know, they do a much better job of eating better, uh, taking five weeks holidays was the minimum per year, you know, uh, it's just a different lifestyle. And for that reason, they live quite a bit longer, but that's never happened before. And if you look at life expectancy here in the United States from 1980, these years from 2014, all the way up to 2018 was downslope. Okay. And it's not even that high. It's only 78. And we're one of the most technologically advanced countries in the world. I mean, it shocked me when I saw this stuff. Luckily last year was the first year it went up. And unfortunately, of course, with the COVID, it's probably going to go down, but it's not related to, to this. But, you know, that curb around the year 2013, 2014 started to dip. And amazingly, in Switzerland, where I was living, people were living a lot longer and there's no dip. And you look at any country and here in Italy, no dip. Okay. And you can go online from 1980 to 2000, Japan, one of the you know, places where people live the longest, no dip at all. And they're living till 85. Look at the curve here. So even though they're living, you know, almost a decade longer than we are in the United States, United States started going like this and everywhere else is still going, you know, upwards. And that a lot of that has to do with nutrition. And a lot of that has to do with antioxidants. Because like I said, when you have immune cell dysregulation, and that can be caused from, like I said, diabetes, perio, or vitamin D deficiency or other antioxidant deficiencies, then your whole body's weakened, then your chance of having, you know, infection problems, it's systemic. So your whole body now has an issue. Um, I got the scanner for research purposes only, and I was happy about it because it allowed me to take antioxidant scores um, from light. So it was a real neat device. And of course we correlated it with blood work. So we would, in our patients now, when they were coming in during the research phases, and I'll show the data, we would take blood work on everybody before and after supplements. And I'll show you the percentage of people that were deficient. And then we'd have this easy way to test their vitamin D with a symbol, a little drop. And we had a nice easy way to measure their antioxidant scores from a little device. And the way it works is that it shines a light, okay? And the more antioxidants that you have, the more that UV light basically reflects back. So the more the light shines and the more it's bouncing back and it's being measured here, it's just bouncing off of antioxidants. So it's a nice, easy way. It's been calibrated, developed at the University of Utah, and they've done a lot of work with that little device, which is cool. Now, when you test the population, the first thing I want to say, when you look at what is the unhealthiest thing in the world to do, smoking, okay? We've tested many, many, many people you can be a 400 pound obese man and you can be a skinny, beautiful 25 year old girl. And when we measure scores, it's always worse than smokers. It would shock me. Okay. I cannot tell you how bad smoking is. And I actually wonder if like implant failure rates, et cetera, which are higher in smokers, whether or not it's caused from the actual smoke uh, and the nicotine, et cetera, or if it's a reflection of them now having lower antioxidant scores. So if you know people, in your, you know, 
network, family, et cetera, that are smokers, really key in on getting them tested for antioxidants and just making sure that they're supplementing. Because like I said, that's one thing that drops the scores and that's only five cigarettes per day. That was a lot worse than even being 35% body fat wasn't nearly as bad, okay? And of course, um, if you're supplementing the whole fruits and vegetables, of course, the higher it's gonna go, that's a no brainer. Um, and, but interesting for our group was, okay, let's, let's give them the supplements now. So as we're giving them the supplements, some people were taking them irregular, some people taking them once per day, some people taking them twice per day, and you could bump them up a lot. So even this population that was deficient for starters and not eating any vegetables or fruit, you know, with the simple two a day, we could in four weeks, get them up to where we needed them for surgery, uh, which was very cool. And, uh, you know, we tested over time, you know, how things go and where we're trying to score, et cetera. And of course I was the researcher because of course, you know, I'm always looking for controls. I said, well, what's the difference between your supplements that are made there? And what, are, you know, me just going to a, a grocery store and buying some Centrum and, you know, going to the vitamin shop and buying vitamin D3. And that's where I learned, you know, there's really a big difference between quality of supplements. Like I said, it was by testing some of these other brands uh, to figure it out. And like I said, I recommend to people to actually do the test themselves, you know, find, find us, I'll show you the blood tests that we actually do. They're not very expensive. They're about 200 bucks. Test yourself, find your own scores, take supplements and figure out if it improves, if you're deficient in some things and you can see the difference in quality between certain types of supplements. It shows directly in your blood levels when you, when you further test. So the goal of Denimedica was to develop something that was high quality, and that would fulfill this goal as you're a dentist and I'm going to go into an implant surgery or bone grafting surgery. And I do not want to ever place another implant in somebody that's vitamin D deficient. I just said, no way. Um, and that, that was how this concept was developed. And we started collaborating a lot with uh, nutritionists, of course, and endocrinologists. And then of course, from my side, we were doing the testing before and after. So, when everything was set and ready to go, uh, we had a great partner. So I had done some work at the university and, uh, you know, we always like to have third parties test some of the work that we're doing. So this was a, a third party group out in Portugal and they're called the white clinic and they place a lot of zirconium plants and they do a lot of holistic type work and, uh, had the pleasure to work really with uh, Dr. Anna Paz and Dr. Miguel Stanley, whom I both respect very, very much, uh, for the work that they've done. Um, and I want to show you the data. So, you know, we had this, we wanted to address every single concept. We had the tester from the United States. We had a tester from Europe. And the first thing we wanted to, to test was if we do the blood reading on one device from us versus the other de device from Europe, are they the same? And is it the same when you do blood work? Okay. That was, that was one step. So with every single patient coming in, we take three vitamin D testers tests, two with the finger prick, one with blood work. And then we'd also measure their antioxidant scores and we compare the antioxidant scores to blood work. Okay. And we used, of course, the device. So I sent the device that I had uh, to Portugal to do these testing. Now, these are a bunch of different patients. Uh, these are the vitamin D levels after uh, supplementing, but I just want to look at the scores. So this blue one is the lab score. So when you get a vitamin D and this is the rapid D tester. So one finger prick way to do it. Uh, from US, and this is the vitamin 4D test uh, from Europe. Look at the levels. They're all almost identical, okay? This little device that you take the little finger prick is literally within, I think they said four points. So if you're 35, you can be between 31 and 39. And I said, you know what? If you can get me scoring between four points, I'm happy every single time because all I want to know as a dentist is, are you deficient or are you ready to go and can I place this implant? That's it. So that was perfect. So we treat patients this way. When they were deficient, then we would give them the supplements. That's Dynamedica. And that was a six week protocol. It's four weeks before implant placement. So it's no longer 12 weeks, it's four. And then we do two weeks after. And there was a reason why we did that because at the beginning we were only doing four, but we found that again, after surgery, it's stressful. And if you did a big surgery, for example, a full arch case, that's a very stressful period. So you might get your patient to, you know, gradually go to 40 to 60 or 50, let's say, but the, literally the day after they've done that full arch case, they might drop back down to 35 or 30 just from the stress of the procedure. And so then we just said, okay, we'll keep supplementing them for two weeks after. This is not something that you take on a day-to-day -day basis, okay? 
Some, some perio uh, periodontists will give half doses for perio of patients. So let's say your patient has periodontal disease and you want to make sure that their levels are continuously at, at a, a good level, you can half the dose, but it's not designed for that. It's designed for a super dose. We say we're going to give you a lot of stuff. You're going to take it four weeks before, two weeks after, and then you're done. And um, these were the before and after, okay? And amazingly, here's before in blue, here's after supplementing for, for, the, for the six weeks here. And every single patient made it into the right range, okay? You never had to worry about an overdose, which is over 100, so that's not a concern. 82% of the population was vitamin D deficient upon entering the study, okay? And there's something to be said by that because again, when these teeth are failing and you got perio disease and you got to place them, a lot of these patients are not going to be, you know, at the right. Um, and then 35% of the population had uh, insufficient antioxidant scores. Okay, and of course, after supplementing, we could bump them up. So it was a very interesting study, like I said, to do uh, this kind of work. Now we learned one other thing that was interesting, and there's two groups uh, specifically that I really want to target. We always do six weeks, okay? That would be 90% of the patients. Four weeks before surgery, you take the supplements, two weeks after. And there's two ways to get it that I'll show you. You can either buy it at a discounted price and resell it in your office. Or for those that don't wanna do that, you can get the little brochures and just give it to your patient and say, look, you know, I recommend you take this. And you just explain to them that the deficiency of vitamin D is very high risk for implant failures. And then they can go buy it directly from, from Dental Medica. Now, Smokers, you would give them the six weeks and they wouldn't always turn to the positive. And for that reason, in smokers and diabetics primarily, those are the two groups that we say, you know what, it's better to double dose them because they're so much more complicated to treat, number one, and their healing potential is lower that you really want to make sure that, you know, they're starting lower, especially smokers, you really, and you want them to really be at a, a high level when you go into surgery. So for those guys, we recommend eight weeks before surgery, you give them the supplements and four weeks after. The rest of the population, just four weeks before and two weeks after, okay? And if you have to do an immediate placement, you know, somebody comes in, fractured tooth, you don't know the vitamin D scores. I mean, I always do because we test them. But if you're not one of these people that tests, you know, 100% of these cases, like I said, the minimum you should do is say, look, Mrs. Smith, uh, I know you have a tooth fracture and you're in a lot of pain right now. Uh, I don't know your vitamin D scores. Do you know them by chance? If she says, no, I have never taken a test. You know, you say, well, I'm going to recommend you right now. If you have the Dena Medica, you, you get it to her. If you don't have it, then you say, run right away to the vitamin uh, shop and get 5,000 units of vitamin D. Okay. It'll help your, your implants. Okay. Minimum. Okay. That's the least you can do as a dentist for your, your patients. Now, as I mentioned, this is a super dose. And so there's four capsules to take uh, in the morning and in the evening, morning and night. And you'll see a lot of the cofactors such as vitamin D is 3,000 units in the morning, 3,000 in the evening. So you're taking 6,000 units per day. And by law, that's actually the most you can take, okay? So when you actually collaborate with these nutritionists, if you give more than 6,000 units per day, and I know some people do it, um, the issue with doing that is that uh, it's over it's higher than what the endocrine society uh, considers relevant. And at that point there, legally, you're also supposed to put a little red label on your packages and you have to say, look, this is outside the legal doses of vitamin D. That's number one. Number two, and I think more importantly, if I go back here, especially at this graph, even when we give 6,000 units uh, you know, per day, some of these patients will go randomly and sometimes it's unpredictable up to 80. So look at this person started at 30, which is primarily deficient, and they went up to 82, okay, after only four weeks when we were testing them or six weeks later. So you got to be a little bit careful. It's always better to be a little bit more cautious and do your testing, uh, but definitely, definitely don't give more than 6,000 units per day. Like I said, sometimes I hear people recommend 10,000 units and I say, whew, like you have not done your, your proper research because like I said, one, it's outside, this is the United States. So maybe in another country, it's fine. But in the United States, I can see a lot of people getting a lot of big trouble if they, they start to recommend this. Um, as I mentioned, the cool thing about this was that, and that's the reason why 
as well. The medical doctors do it. You can buy it in office and then you can just resell it to patients. Okay. And it's kind of a nice little incentive. You don't need to do it. I mean, it's not necessary by any means, but the nice thing about it is that, you know, if you buy them in, in bulk, like we do, you can go from $58 up to 98. So you can make $40 every single time you sell one of these things. And uh, we work in a big office. It's got 16 uh, surgical rooms with many doctors that are working there. You know, we'll go through a thousand of these uh, Dentomedicas per year. And, you know, you're actually, the, the office will make an extra $40,000, you know, reselling something that's actually very, very good for your patients, right? Um, so, you know, you know, you can consider it. But at the minimum, like I said, one of two things you need to do. One, give the patient the little brochures and say, I recommend you get this stuff. Or two, you have to recommend at least 5,000 units. And I'm almost sure that when more data comes out, it will be like required by law. It's going to be the type of thing that if you're a dentist and you've not, you're placing an implant and you've not said, you know, take vitamin D, I think people will get into, you know, legal issues for lack of, lack of care for your patients. It's more and more becoming a standard. These are the little brochures, like I said, a lot of clinics will do this too. You get them typically for free from the company. Uh, if you see them at a booth at a conference, they'll give you a pack of 100. And like I said, you got an implant case coming up. You just say, Mrs. Smith, I recommend you take this. Very simply, you give her one and you just tell her this is to help with your healing. Okay, you're going to heal better and there's going to be less of a chance that you're going to have an implant failure. Um, so, you know, it discusses the key benefits, et cetera. And, you know, at that point there, you as a dentist, you've done your job. You know, whether or not that patient takes the supplements and does everything according, that's now in her shoes. But me, myself, I've done my job and, and my background knowledge is there and I've done my job and I've, you know, recommended the things that are in her best interest, okay? Um, I've already gone over this slide. Um, if you wanna read uh, two good articles that are easily available on the internet, this is one that I recommend from Dr. Scott Froome. Uh, was written, look at not very long ago, February 3rd, vitamin D deficiency, impact on wound healing and implant failure. And Dr. Froome is a very well-respected colleague. Uh, he explains how vitamin D deficiency firstly affects wound healing. And in the paper, like I said, you know, he shows the same thing. Patients with vitamin D deficiency showed an early implant failure rate 11.1% compared to 2.9% with normal levels of vitamin, okay? And he actually showed one of his cases. Early dental implant failure four months later. It's those cases that you place you're like, this is a slam dunk case and it fails and you don't have an explanation for it. And the real explanation is actually it's a vitamin D deficiency. We just recently wrote this article myself with uh, Dr. Michael Picos and Dr. Mark Bashera, And we titled the article, it's written in Dentistry Today. Uh, it, was on, it's, it came out April 1st. Vitamin D deficiency and early implant failure, the title, what every clinician should know. Okay, And it's really to stress the point that you know, not enough people know what they're doing when they're placing these implants with respect to vitamin D deficiency and how important it is. And we really made the tables that say, this is what you need. This is the easy way to do the test. This is the failure rates, okay? To make it very clear to clinicians like, hey, wake up, you know, we need to do a better job collectively uh, amongst colleagues. And in it, like I said, we had one of our cases uh, by one of our authors that just, you know, perfect case, a lot of bone, bleeding implants go in. This is post-op, the implants look nice. And then this is one month later. It looks like a bomb went off, okay? One implant came out, the other implant's failing. You've lost three quarters of your bone in the area and you're scratching your head and what, what's going on? And upon testing, okay, it was actually Mark Bashara's case. He wasn't doing anything, vitamin D. He's one of my old colleagues. I went to school with him. And he called me up, he said, why do you think this kind of thing happens? I said, vitamin D. He's like, really? He didn't know about it. And I said, go test your patient. Got the test done, 12 nanograms, okay, per ml. That's critically low. And uh, when he had that, I said, do you want to publish an article together? Because I think more dentists need to know that. And uh, he, he accepted to publish it with our, our group and also to show the case just to make clinicians more aware of it. He had, you know, no shame in it. Uh, you know, just wanted to help the field out. So interesting uh, study there. Again, now the nice thing about it is that it's actually distributed by a dental company. Okay, before, uh, about a year ago, it was sold by the main headquarters in California. But more recently, um, Emergenova, which sells uh, Zeramax implant systems. And I think more holistic people, it's one of the reasons why the holistic community 
uh, is a little bit more into you know overall health, etc. And uh, he became the main distributor here in the United States, which was good. So if you ever see this uh, at a conference with Xeramax, they might not have the Dentomedica out there, but you can always reach out to them uh, and ask them questions regarding it. Last thing I want to share, if anybody wants to do a test on themselves, I highly recommend it. There's two, uh, one SpectraCell, and they're amazing little tests. You can get them free as a practitioner. The nice thing about it is, is that the company wants you as a practitioner to do like to start prescribing these tests for your patients and for you to learn they give you a free test so you can get a free 280 eighty dollar test and then it'll give you all your levels vitamin a vitamin b's vitamin d the whole thing and then you can figure out what you're deficient in and if you do take supplements it's a nice way to figure out where you're deficient and they actually give recommendations for what the doses are in our in our population like i said 100 percent of our patients that have implant failures have some kind of vitamin d deficiency it's, it never ever fails. Um, and it gives you the levels. And another one, probably this one here, I recommend a little bit more. Um, it's called Vibrant America. And uh, I don't know where it's located. I think it's, it's in the United States for sure. I can't remember where exactly it's located, but they have a little bit more testing and it's a little bit cheaper. So you get a little bit bigger panel and they do both extracellular and intracellular analysis of, of the same panel, but you get both the intracellular and extracellular reading. So it's a nice little test there as well. And like I said, if you ever have an implant fail, et cetera, you know, you can very quickly figure out, you know, what the reason is. So that's uh, everything. And uh, like I said, in conclusion, I just want to, you know, make aware, never forget how important your overall health is and more importantly, how important your immune system is uh, during uh, these integrations. Um, and that's everything. So I want to thank everybody for your time. And uh, if anybody, like I said, wants to learn really from a good course on zirconia implants, I highly recommend, like I said, uh, Dieter Bosart from Switzerland. And if anybody wants to learn more about doing natural approaches, learning about dentin grafting, platelet-rich fibrin, uh, he and I put on a good course down at Nova uh, once per year. So thank you very much for your attention. Well, we do have some questions here. Sure. Where people have um, been good about typing in some questions. I just got to get to where the questions are. So let me get over here, chat screen. And let's see. Well, one of the questions that I had do you ever check uh, patients to see if they're interleukin 6 to see if they would be a good candidate for any kind of an implant at all? Um, no. We don't uh, test interleukins. I know it was done genetically. Some of the interleukins are actually, um, of course, they're correlated with it, but the failure rate of a patient that's interleukin-6 deficient or has too much interleukin-6 uh, versus somebody that's deficient in vitamin D is, you know, there's no strong correlation there. At least it hasn't been established yet. So until we can establish more direct links, uh, we're, not, we're not doing that at the moment. Um, yeah. Okay. And then um, one of the questions on here, it says, did you use new contact or old? And I'm not really sure what the, the question was, but uh, let me go down to the next one. It says, should we be testing vitamin D levels, even for extractions and bone grabbing? Also, yep. if a patient mentions their vitamin D levels were normal at their doctor's visit, which is crap because they don't even know what normal is. How old can those results be before we consider retesting? That's a very good question, actually. Um, you know, I've gotten in the habit where I don't like taking chances. So if somebody is even in the range of like 30 to 35, I supplement them because I don't want that chance and I don't want that risk. And I don't know if that day that I did the test, maybe I was, you know, four points off. And instead of being 31, maybe I was actually at 27, you know, so I, I don't like that. Now, there are people in society that are very, very good with their health. They will come in with their scores, they'll show you and they track it and they'll talk about the supplements they take, et cetera. Those patients that just say, you know what, we're ready to go, right? And there are patients like that. But the great majority of patients either have no idea, have not done a test in the last nine months, uh, do not know the links, do not know how important it is. And so that's where we need to be educators, right? You need to educate your patient on its important importance. And then afterwards, uh, 
follow up and, and provide them with recommendations. And, and like, so do you, I guess what I'm trying to see is, would you prefer that they refer out to a primary care and have a network working with them? Or do you just prefer to accept that responsibility on your own? Oh yeah. I mean, you know, they're, the levels are going up. So when it's been shown in studies, et cetera, when I, when I look at healthcare as a dental practitioner in general and the level that it's at, if you're at a stage where you can collaborate with a medical doctor and do it, by all means, keep doing it and uh, congratulations for doing it. But there are 98% of dentists that are doing absolutely nothing. And right. those are the people that I'm trying to target, right? Okay. It, I mean, and it, again, the reality is, is that they're vitamin D deficient. I'm fully comfortable that I can do that reading and get an accurate reading. And I'm fully confident that I can give them a supplement that's recommended. In fact, I don't even know if the doctor was to recommend something, if it would be as effective as, you know, Dentomedica, because we've tested it and we know exactly what's working. So if that doctor says, I recommend 8,000 units of vitamin D with no cofactors, I would not feel as confident as I am in, in Dentomedica. So that's, that's where I stand on that. Uh, I like to do things that are more evidence-based and have research papers behind them, so. Yeah. Okay, the next, uh, I put a link on here for everybody because the links will show up in the uh, recordings. So I put the link to the biotech uh, for the vitamin D test kits because someone had asked about that. And so that's on there. And then I also put the link on to so the- biotech, uh, biotech is actually the European distributor. You can't get yeah. that in uh, North America. Biotech is a, a company based out of France. That's where we used to buy it from in Switzerland. Oh, I got you. So then, then I gave a Dentamedica. That's the U.S. one. So the okay. if you live in Europe, then Biotech, uh, they're based out of Paris, and we collaborate with them as well. So when we did the study with the White Clinic, they had the little scanner from Biotech Dental and then mm -hmm. imported one from the United States. And the reason why we did it was we wanted to see if one was working better than the other. And actually, there was no difference between the two groups, as I showed in the, the study. And I wonder if we buy in bulk through the academy, if they'd be willing to give us some kind of a discount. So, no, I, yeah, I, I, I will try to get in touch with them. Um, I, I know when I send my patients out for a D, it's about $60 to get a D test done. And all I care about is a D3. Yep. Um, um, well, the nice thing about these tests, actually, is that in office, we charge our patients, right? We'll charge them the same thing. So we, most people will charge $59. And the little strips that you buy that, that are uh, you know, one-time use, those are about $15, I believe. So you know, you're, you're making a little bit of money doing the test. Uh, but you know, even, if, even if a big case you know, and somebody doesn't want to do the test, sometimes I just throw it in for free because I don't want to place implants in somebody that I know has not been tested or doesn't know their vitamin D levels. I mean, for me, it's just a little bit scary. And quite honestly, it's uh, getting to the point where it'd be a little bit, uh, uh, I don't want to say unethical, but it's just below standard, I would say, uh, when we know the data. And then there's a couple of people in here. Somebody says, I use D3 and K2 thoughts. And have you considered that in your research? Well, of course, um, all vitamin D has to absorb with K2, so that's an absolute requirement. Um, studies have shown that, and this is coming from uh, orthopedic field, if you just give vitamin D with no vitamin K, you can actually pull some of the calcium and the mineral density out of bone instead of putting it in. So you actually do the reverse of what you're trying to do. So definitely uh, vitamin D and, and vitamin K have to be in the right uh, ratios. I always tell people, you know, uh, I do a lot of research, of course, in the dental space, and, and we're, I, I know my topics very, very well. We are not experts in nutrition, and I don't care, you know, some people have more knowledge, there's no question, but you'll never have more knowledge than the endocrinologist that has spent 25 years doing research on that field, okay? And I remember one time, I thought it was so crazy because there was a debate between uh, endocrinologists and uh, somebody working in another field that was talking about supplements. And the amazing thing about it, and when you think about it, is if you're a dentist, you know, imagine you're getting guidelines on how to do periodontal therapy or how often you should do it from an endocrinologist. Imagine the endocrinologist would come up to you as a dentist and say, you know what, I think your three month recalls are complete nonsense. I think it should be 45 days. You know, you'd be scratching your head like, 
excuse me, right? And that's how I feel about their field. So I respect the field that they work in. They know their regulations. They know exactly where's too much and not enough. They've done a lot more research in that field. So it's collaborations, like I said, and uh, we follow their recommendations absolutely to a T. Yeah. Um, I, I know particularly in my office, I use something th through orthomolecular until I get their D up and then change them over to something else. And it, it costs them all of about $7 to do. Um, but I, I see the, the price on this other one. And went, Woo, that's a little spendy for me, but I've got a person on here. It says, what do you do about people who are chronically low despite supplementing at high levels? In other words, they don't absorb like they've got a genetic VDR defect. Uh, you know, those are challenging cases and those ones there probably require the collaboration of a, a, an endocrinologist. So at that stage there, of course, then it becomes very important to do testing, right? The minute you find out info like that, I can do testing and I can find out where they're at. If after a round of Dentamedica, for instance, they don't get improvement, then I'm concerned. And at that point there, I'm sending them to an endocrinologist. Now, in the endocrinology field, they can do something as simple as do like muscle injections with vitamin D in very high doses. Right. They can do different things to get them up to the levels. And they have done that before. So some of my patients have gone through that um, as a result of exactly that situation. I don't, like I said, I'm very conservative. I, I don't like to take chances. I realize that failures and other things are very bad for my reputation. And I try and do everything by the books. So when I have something like that, again, refer out. I, I collaborate a lot with a lot of experts when I can. Okay. And there was a question on here. It says, can offices private label the supplements if they buy them in bulk? I have no idea. I feel yeah. like, I mean, it's like private. Why would you private label a supplement and not an implant? I mean, this is... <laughs> Um, and then the rest of the comments that are really on here are kudos to you about how wonderful the information was and how appreciative they are. Um, a bunch of thank yous on here. So thank you. I, I think we're going to open it up for anybody else's questions that wants to unmute themselves for just a moment. Oh. Got anybody? really <laughs> okay then what i'm going to do is we'll go ahead and end the recording for tonight it uh in about 20 minutes you'll probably get a, an email that i'll drop off to michael letting you know that it it's up you know it'll take us a little while to actually get it on our website but there's a part on the bottom that you can go back and 